Patricia Gibson. <coughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm delighted to co-sponsor this motion today. Um, this very important debate with the Honourable Member for Solihull, with whom I have sparred in the past, but today with whom I am in complete agreement. The cost of scamming in our society is undoubtedly huge, and this cost cannot just be counted in terms of pounds and pence, although the financial cost is significant. Scamming does not exclusively but disproportionately affect the elderly and other vulnerable members of our communities, and this problem is becoming greater with each passing day. The Office for National Statistics predicts the number of elderly people living in our communities will increase by 34 per cent from 11.6 million to 15.7 million by 2030, and those living with dementia will increase from 850,000 to 2.1 million people by 2030. The people who perpetrate these scams use very sophisticated techniques to repeatedly, in some cases, scam their victims, whilst trading standards, hard pressed as they are, are working on the front line to do all they can to safeguard the vulnerable. The most sinister, the most cynical and cruel aspect of scamming is that it is criminal activity that targets those who are the most vulnerable in their very own home. The one place where any of us should feel most safe becomes the setting for conning people out of their money via sales scripts, data collection and targeted mail. And scams can range from pension fraud, bogus equity release schemes, fictitious prize draws, false investment opportunities, upfront payments to release lottery wins, upfront payment for building work that is either never started or never completed, and investment scams, and so on. And the most common telephone scams are cold calls, and I hope everyone in the chamber today will feel able to support my 10-minute rule bill on cold calls next week, which I really don't have time to tell you about, but it's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> the impact goes far beyond financial loss. The impact is emotional, psychological, and even has been shown to have an impact on physical well-being. At worst, the impact of scams can ruin lives, split families with the consequences lasting long beyond the initial trauma of financial loss. Indeed, even where financial losses are comparatively low, scams still lead to a breakdown in consumer confidence. The full effects of the harm caused by scams is really difficult to estimate, as only around 5% of victims report they have lost money. We know the average victim loses around £1,000, but we also know that many lose hundreds of thousands of pounds. We know that victims of scams often feel very embarrassed and afraid that their families will judge them as no longer able to live on their own, which can also lead to scams not being reported and thereby leaving victims open and vulnerable to repeat scams. And it's important to remember that some victims find it extremely difficult even to admit that they have been the victim of a crime. But let's not forget the impact of dementia and other impairments which make vulnerability much more pronounced and the ability to repeatedly target an individual much more possible. As the Honourable Gentleman from Solihull has pointed out, it's been demonstrated that victims of scams are nearly two and a half times more likely to require increased care provision or be dead within the two years subsequent to being a victim of scamming. It's been reported that scam victims often experience a rapid drop in their physical health after the realisation that they have been scammed. The scale of the problem and its associated costs are absolutely huge. And alongside this growing problem, we all know that trading standards are struggling to cope, although the work they do is worthy of very high praise and demands our respect. I also want to highlight an excellent, the excellent work carried out by an organisation called CIFAS, which works to prevent fraud and financial crime through the sharing of confirmed, confirmed fraud data. And last year, CIFAS prevented more than one billion in fraud loss by sharing data across sectors. In my own constituency of North Ayrshire and Arran, 
CIFA data shows that 278 frauds took place and there were 103 victims of fraud in 2015. But we know that this is a mere snapshot, snapshot of the true level of fraud, which is likely to be much, much higher. At this stage, I also want to single out for particular praise North Ayrshire Citizens Advice Service in my own constituency, which carried out a range of activities to promote Scam Awareness Month in July, providing training to advisors and raising awareness of scams amongst clients, working in partnership with local community groups, the Third Sector, Police Scotland and Ayrshire College. And they also worked closely with my own local member of the Scottish Parliament, one, mem um, one Kenneth Gibson, MSP, who I mention purely in the interests of domestic harmony. <laughs> Scams do so much more than rob people of their money. It robs them of their confidence, their belief in themselves, their belief in their own judgment, their self-esteem, their willingness to trust people and the help they may be able to offer them. And ultimately, it robs people of their ability to live full, happy and independent lives. But what makes all of us vulnerable to scams is shown by research carried out by which all of us are overconfident about our ability to spot a scam. And that makes us, ironically, all the more vulnerable. The gap between confidence and ability is dangerous. So what can we do about this problem? I absolutely agree with the suggestion put forward by Trading Standards that financial institutions should recognise that consumers, clients with dementia, are by definition more at risk of being scammed and measures need to be taken to protect this group as a duty of care. Those who are diagnosed with dementia live with a cognitive impairment and this must be recognised. The sharing of personal details and information to other organisations should require a clear opt-in as opposed to an opt-out. And it should also be the case that the normal default position of charities and other organisations should be that personal details are not passed on or shared except to report a safeguarding concern where there is a suspicion that a person may be at risk or harm of scamming. In addition, customers should be able to formally notify their bank in writing, stating that they feel at risk and request that all transactions over a certain amount to new payees have a 24-hour delay before being processed. And this will give time for the proposed transaction to be challenged and potentially stop scammed money, leaving a scam victim's account. These eminently sensible and fairly straightforward measures would do much to protect those most at risk of scamming, the elderly and the vulnerable in our communities. And I urge the Minister today to reflect on these proposals to help us tackle this problem by confronting people who are sorry, to help us tackle the problem which confronts people who are robbed in their very own homes and subsequently find the experience scarring. The effects are very far reaching indeed. So let's do more to to protect the victims of scams, it's the least we can do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.